We know that based on the numbers, about 3,500 children in the U.S., infants, uh, die of sudden unexplained infant death, or SUID. Mostly children between three and six experience frequent nightmares. If the, it is disrupting sleep to the point that the awakenings are prolonged, and they're sleeping in a constant sleep deprivation, then it's a problem. You being a well-rested parent is exceedingly important to the well-being of your child. We're also developing a technology within Duke that we've tested that will come out probably the next few months. That's the only piece of information you can share with us? That sounds very, that sounds very highly classified. I, I could tell you, but then I'd have to kill you. Dr. Sujay Mansuklal Kansagra is a pediatric neurologist and sleep medicine expert at Duke University. Renowned for his research and publications on sleep disorders in children, he actively educates on sleep health to improve well-being. Kanzagra is also a prolific author, known for his ability to translate complex medical concepts into clear, accessible language. If the parents are severely sleep deprived, you're putting your child in far more danger, uh, significantly far more danger than just having them cry. And so it doesn't mean you have to leave your child in a room all by themselves. A lot of parents say, I feel uncomfortable doing that. I said, don't. It's called extinction with parental presence. We all have a genetic hand that we've been dealt regarding how much sleep we need. And we can't change it five, six years out to say, hey, is there any negative consequence from allowing your child to have discrete periods of crying during the few days of sleep training? And the answer is The Avenue of the Strongest is a podcast dedicated to exploring the lives and experiences of the most inspiring individuals from around the world. Each episode features interviews with fascinating guests who share their insights and wisdom on a variety of topics, including education, impact, motivation, health, and learning. Here are your hosts, Aniette Chowdhury and Vlad Suleiman. Over the last year, 86.6% .6 of our regular viewers have not yet hit the subscription button. Your subscription means a lot to us. It's a small gesture on your end and a huge leap forward for our channel. If you wouldn't mind, we would love to ask you if you found our channel informative and engaging, if you can please hit that subscription button. Your subscription means a lot to us. It allows us to go ahead and continue to put out great content, better guests, and as always, we will always put out two episodes per week. Thank you so much. Dr. Consagra, welcome. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. I know you're a pediatric neurologist and director of the Pediatric Neurology Sleep Medicine at Duke University. I'm especially excited to get to speak with you since I actually have a six-month-old daughter. I'm a father for the first time. Oh, so congrats. this is extremely a relevant conversation to me. Uh, Vlad over here has two, two, two kids, but they're a little bit older, uh, but not, not too old. So this is a very relevant uh, and, and incredible conversation I'd love to ask, as you can imagine myself. Uh, my daughter is six months old right now, and uh, let's just say sleep is definitely an issue. <laughs> <laughs> you learn very quickly how sleep deprived you really can be. Um, and uh, it's really those early parenting years. It's really tough, really tough. Yeah, I, 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 I agree. Now, so I, I want to kind of start the conversation by talking a little bit about sleep training and the sleep training methods, because this is obviously a huge topic. And so I kind of want to lay out some of the f foundational uh, uh, work here, because every parent researches this, and there's some yes. controversy, c controversy around that if you're a good parent or a bad parent in the sleep training. So can we first talk about yeah. what exactly is sleep, sleep training? And then what are your recommended methods based on your research and years of experience? Yeah, so I'll tell you sleep training is essentially any intervention that you're using, a behavioral intervention to help teach an infant or a toddler or an older child of a certain age to fall asleep independently without having too much external help. And the rationale behind this is that we wake up multiple times at night. That's a completely normal part of sleep physiology. All of us, every human being wakes up at night. If as an adult or as a young child, you develop a dependence on something external to help you transition to sleep, when you wake up during a normal nighttime awakening, you will expect that same intervention to be there to help you fall asleep. And so the whole premise behind this is uh, oftentimes young children, infants, become dependent on having external rocking or holding or feeding, et cetera, to transition to sleep. So the brains learn, I only go from wake to sleep when that external help is put in place. Sleep training essentially is helping infants learn how to self-soothe or get to sleep on their own without any external help 
such that when they wake up at night, if they're still sleepy, they don't need any help going right back to sleep. They can transition to right. sleep on their own and they can quote unquote sleep through the night. And so, 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 I, so now a lot of the controversy starts where, you know, you, you look at any kind of video related to this and there are comments saying sleep training. If your child is crying, you go pick up your child because that mm -hmm. child needs you. Uh, but, uh, let, but before we talk about that, when is it appropriate to start sleep training? Because I know it's not from day one, correct? That's 100% correct, right? So there is a, there is a responsible right way to, to do this based on what we know of, you know, with lots of studies that have been performed on this, these particular interventions. And so typically at the earliest, if your child is otherwise healthy, doesn't have any medical issues and is growing and thriving, then the earliest is usually around four months. But by six months, typically you're pretty safe. Some children will respond as early as four months but other children, you have to wait till closer to six months. And on average, if you look across all the studies that have been done, it averages out to about five months is when these interventions are being implemented. So somewhere between four and six months is the earliest. Can you be late? Can you be late? Yeah. Yes, you can. Absolutely. So you know, there's uh, many people will say there's no there's no late age. There's, you're never too old to sleep train. And so I kind of joke mm -hmm. that many adults also have what we call sleep onset associations. This is what I was referring to, those external things that are helping you transition to sleep. Well, many adults have sleep onset associations. So if you ever met an adult that has to have the TV on to fall asleep, that's mm -hmm. a sleep onset association. Your brain knows, okay, I go from wake to sleep when that television is on. And if that TV turns off and they wake up in the middle of the night, it's going to be harder for them to turn their brain off and go to sleep. So really, this can apply really at any age. And you can train your brain to learn to go to sleep without these external crutches to help. Okay, so let's just get one thing clear. So you're not a bad parent if you decide to sleep train or use a sleep training method from when your child is, let's just assume in this case, six months old. You Absolutely not. So, so when it comes to the debate, when, when we look at research studies that have been done on sleep training, there's this wonderful review that looked at 52 studies, well-designed studies when it came to behavioral interventions to help your child sleep. And of the 52 studies, 49 of them show that there was some type of a benefit, whether it be parental report of sleep, objective measures of sleep, marital satisfaction, maternal depression scores. 49 of them showed some improvement, and three of them showed no change. And there have been no studies that have actually shown a harm coming out of sleep mm. studies that are coming out of sleep interventions to help with, with sleep training. And people oftentimes refer to like one-off articles that look at things like cortisol, et cetera. But mm. we have great long-term studies looking five, six years out to say, hey, is there any negative consequence from allowing your child to have discrete periods of crying during the few days of sleep training? And the answer is no, which is not unexpected because it's a very short-term type of a process. And if you think about it, in many ways, you're also trying to help prevent your child from crying. You know, having, having to need something every time you wake up at night during a normal awakening and crying consistently for you know weeks to months is is also not great so it's not that you're like making your child cry in many ways you can say we're trying to help prevent your child from having prolonged crying long term that being said i'm the first one to tell all families no you you don't have to sleep train by no means mm -hmm. do you have to sleep train it is a safe and effective choice if that's what you decide as a family as a unit that that's something you want to do but there is nobody, no sleep specialist to go in there and tell somebody they have to sleep train. But on the mm -hmm. flip side of this, I also don't want parents to feel like they need something to change. They want to make a change and be scared out of it because of all the nonsense that's out there on social media and all the debate that occurs in the social media world. In the medical world, when it comes to literature, there's really no debate. That's why your pediatricians mm -hmm. are all going to support it. Right. Now, that makes sense. And in terms of sleep training, can, can we can we kind of walk through? So let's just say, you know, well, I'm a parent now, and actually we, we haven't done any sleep training methods, but we are about to because of some of the issues that we're experiencing. Mm -hmm. And so where does one start? Because I know there's various methods uh, that you covered, but is there one that you, what, what is it, what is it, what does the data show? Is it any of these methods that are that, that work that the results are the same or or is there a recommended one that you have parents start if they ask yeah you? Th there are four core methods that actually have data to support them based on good research studies that have been done and they range when it comes to the level of crying that you you know you are able to kind of tolerate or willing to have your child go through and so it's very 
parent dependent. And also you, you want to base on the child's temperament. Some children, their temperament is very easygoing and they're able to learn these techniques very quickly. Some children are a little bit higher needs and the temperament may be different. So you want to approach it differently based on, again, child temperament and parental kind of d desires. So on one end, you have what people refer to as cry it out. The formal name for this is called extinction, the extinction technique. And this is, um, this is a technique that has kind of fallen out of favor amongst everybody, including sleep specialists, just because it is kind of endless crying. Nobody feels good about mm -hmm. that. There's data that shows that it's safe and it's effective, uh, but everyone's kind of steered a little bit further away from that over time. There are situations where it can be helpful. If family is reaching kind of a crisis mode, everybody, everything mm -hmm. is falling apart and family's like, I cannot go on living in this way and I'm unsafe driving my child around to their doctor's appointments, et cetera then you may have to resort to the cry it out method. Uh, and I'm happy to go into the details of each of these methods, but that's kind of on one end of the spectrum. The other two that I usually go to are known as graduated extinction, AKA the Ferber method. And the other one is called a camping out method, AKA the chair method. The graduate extinction is a form of, it's the, the goal is the same across all these methods, which is at the start of the night, allowing your child to go to sleep on their own with their own abilities, as opposed to you helping them in some way. So. You do your nighttime routine, do all the things that you enjoy. If you're using the graduate extinction method, you put the child in their safe sleep space, which is typically the crib, when all the routine is complete and you know they're actually sleepy, and then you step away from the crib for a certain amount of time. That can be five minutes, it can be three minutes, it can be you know whatever the family is comfortable with, but five minutes is a good start. And then you wait one minute. And if the child is crying, after one minute, you go back to the crib, you soothe the child while they're still in bed. You don't take them out of the crib, soothe them for one minute and then step away again. And then you wait another five minutes, or you can wait five minutes, then 10 minutes, then every 15 minutes. The whole goal is once the child goes from awake to sleep, they've done so without your help, without your, you know, rocking or holding or singing or patting, et cetera. And if they can do that for two or three nights in a row, usually by night four, you're already seeing improvements in their ability to go to sleep and sleep a little bit better through the night. That's graduated extinction. This podcast is sponsored by Argo Prep, an award-winning educational publisher serving over a million students nationwide. If you're a kindergarten to eighth grade teacher or principal, be sure to check out our supplementary workbooks to get your students ready for standardized state testing. We cover all subjects from kindergarten to eighth grade. Use the coupon code AVENUE for a 25% discount off of all purchase orders. Visit us today at argoprep.com slash store. I, I've been using the Ferber method with my with my uh, second child. Mm -hmm. So my question is, how long should you be training? Because I've been using it, let's say, I believe for a month, maybe a couple of weeks. So my child was sleeping on her own, and then my mother in law came, <laughs> and then she started <laughs> to pick her up, and then everything ruined. And since then, she's not sleeping on her own. So, yes. so for how long should you be training? At, so it's you know it's uh, it's like a permanent. Uh, yes, for them. the grandparents. Well, here's <laughs> here's the fun thing about sleep. I say sleep is is just not a linear process. There's always going to be changes and setbacks and bumps in the road. It'll either be because grandma came to visit. It'll be because you decided to take a family trip and everybody, the sleeping environment changes, teething, coughs and colds, where you have to hold a child and soothe them because they're ill. All those things can cause a little bit of a setback. And so each time you have to do a little bit of a reset. The goal for all these methods is being incredibly consistent when it's time to reinstitute the process of going to sleep independently. So initially, you know, it, this children can respond as quickly as one or two nights, but typically about four or five nights. By the end of the week, you should start seeing improvements. And if you're not seeing improvements after about six or seven days, you kind of have to pause and say, well, could there be something else going on? Could my child have reflux or eczema or something else that could be bothering them? But if the pattern fits, the, and the pattern being they can fall asleep quickly with parental intervention, when they wake up at nighttime, they can be soothed quickly with parental intervention. And, uh, and if parents don't intervene, they will kind of cry and fuss. That's the typical pattern of, of what we call sleep onset association subtype of behavioral insomnia of childhood, the type of sleep issue that responds to sleep training. So if that pattern fits, but if it's a different pattern, and by different pattern, I mean the child is waking up you know, more than five or six times at nighttime, they're waking up at random patterns. Like it can be five after five minutes and after 30 minutes and after one hour, then after another five minutes, that can indicate there could be some sort of pain or discomfort, et cetera. Most children, mm -hmm. once you get them back to sleep, should be able to sleep another hour, about an hour chunk of time. 
because that's how long it takes to go through a full sleep cycle, deep sleep and mm -hmm. back into light sleep. So if the pattern is fitting with that, uh, it should, res that, you know, th that problem should respond to sleep training. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you shouldn't have to do it for long, typically longer than a week. Hmm. I, I actually want to highlight something that is very important, which you mentioned about the cry it out method, which, as you mentioned, it's kind of phased out and nobody recommends it. But you mentioned that it is the go to method if the parents, if the family is in crisis mode. And I wanted to kind of, again, re reiterate that topic because you are completely right. Uh, if the parents are severely sleep deprived, uh, that you're putting your child in far more danger uh, significantly far more danger than just having them cry. I, I don't care as long as it's a safe sleep environment. I don't care how long they cry for, because if you're getting behind the, the behind a car or a motor vehicle, I mean, you can cause some, some serious, some serious issues. And so I, I want to highlight that because we're so, or at least parents are so focused on their child that many of us forget to kind of step back and say, Hey, well, we have to take a look at ourselves because we are the, we're taking care of, of our child, if we're not good, chances are the child's going to be put in a, a more dangerous situation. And again, this is this is a really important point, which is there's a lot of caregiver guilt around sleep training, saying, "Oh, I'm doing this for my sleep." And I kind of take a step back and I say, "Well, the advice that I'm giving you is for your child. You know, I'm a child neurologist. I'm not an adult neurologist. I'm not a parent neurologist. I'm not I'm not a parent sleep specialist. I'm not doing it for mm -hmm. you. I'm doing it for the benefit of your child. But yes, your sleep will also benefit." And just because your sleep benefits doesn't mean that you're doing it for you. You being a well-rested parent is exceedingly important to the well-being of your child for the very things that you mentioned when it comes to just, you know, getting behind the wheel, uh, but even like parental attachment reasons, right? So being present, mm -hmm. being in a, a more positive mood, being well-rested, being attentive to the, to the environment, you know, uh, we make mistakes when we're sleep deprived. We, you know, little things, you know, we're not, as, we're not as coordinated when we're sleep deprived. There are many things that can kind of go wrong. And then we just tend to be, unfortunately, more angry and short-tempered when we're sleep deprived. And all mm. of those things, you know, the best of parents, you can't control it because sleep deprivation just erodes at your soul. I'm pretty convinced that it just erodes at our very core and our essence. And so, yes, sleep training will help your child. It will help you. But the fact that it helps you goes right back and helps your child. And that's important to keep in mind. So all the studies shows that cry it out method is doing no harm to the kids, right? Even with even with the cry it out method, we don't have any data that would indicate that it actually causes any sort of harm to children. And the goal here is, mm. you know, it's all very short term. The goal is to, you know, have a child in a safe, protected space where if something is wrong, of course, if they're hungry or if they have a dirty diaper or, or if, you know, if they're if they're in pain, you're still going to intervene and help them, right? So you're still there to support them and be there for them whenever they need. So even if you're using something like the extinction method, you're going to have a really good monitor to make sure a child is okay, or you're actually even going to sit right in the room with them and just sit across mm -hmm. the room and, and, and just wait. And so it doesn't mean you have to leave your child in a room all by themselves. A lot of parents say, I feel uncomfortable doing that. I say, don't. It's called extinction with parental presence. You can sit right there, you know, and, and wait. That's what I did with my first child. I sat in the room while, you know, he was crying it out and, um, and we got it done in two nights, you know? Um, mm. so, uh, yeah, so lots of different ways to do this and extinction. Yes. Although it's fallen out of favor is effective and it's still safe. And out of all the methods, is there any data saying that which one of it is more effective or not? Or all of, or, or the children? Yeah. There is some data that shows the, the extinction and graduate extinction without parental presence tends to be faster response and more effective. Mm. That being said, you know, there's still abundant amount of data that says that the, all the methods are effective. And so you shouldn't feel like you have to go to the one that's the most effective and is going to happen the quickest. Even if it takes an extra day or two, um, you know, these methods still, still are very effective. Have you Dr. seen parents who are switching, sorry, Annette, switching one method to another method? Or I do. So oftentimes people start with graduated extinction or the Ferber method, which is my go-to method. I like the Ferber method. It's a nice balance between getting it done quickly, but still having parents able to check in and soothe their child. Some parents say, well, when I go in and soothe my child, my child gets 10 times worse. Like they start crying even worse and they seem to be even in more distress when they see me. And I say, well, we have two options. We can switch to the camping out method, which I'm happy to talk about, which is a slower, gradual method, or we switch to extinction. Uh, and extinction with the pure cried out 
you know, again, making sure those caveats, either you're in the room or you're watching them really closely with the monitor. Dr. Consagra, I know you're a pediatric neurologist, but you are the sleep doctor. So uh, we were talking about the parents. Uh, what What is the optimal range that adults should be aiming for for sleep? Because you know what? I have friends <laughs> that swear they get four hours out, four hours of night, uh, four hours of sleep a night, and that's all they need. And they are super productive. And, you know, and, and then on the other hand, we have I have a couple of people that sleep 10 plus hours a day. Yeah. The ranges are all over the place. Please, yeah. you, you have the data, you have the studies. Uh, what is there an actual optimal range? The vast, vast majority of adults will sleep between seven and nine hours. That is their sleep need. And by sleep need, I mean, we all have a genetic hand that we've been dealt regarding how much sleep we need. And we can't change it. But the, based on the best studies that we have, we can't change the amount of sleep we need. But the vast majority of, of, of the world when it comes to adults fall between seven and nine hours. And then when I say seven to nine hours, some people say, okay, well, then I'll just sleep seven every night. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that your range is likely somewhere between seven and nine, and you should get what you think your actual need is. So for me, for example, I like to sleep eight and a half hours per night. If I get seven hours per night every night, I'm going to be very, very sleep deprived. Like this weekend, I went on a camping trip with my son, utterly sleep deprived. You might be able to tell. I'm utterly sleep deprived. Mm. And, I'm, and so, but we're probably sleeping like six to seven hours a night. And many people say, oh, I can get by fine on that. I can't. You know, I need, I need eight and a half. So the goal is finding what you need. Now, the interesting part about people that say I only need four hours of sleep. There are people that are short sleepers that actually have a genetic change that allows them to get by on less sleep than the average adult. That's usually, mm. you know, five, six hours, and sometimes in rare cases, even less, but typically about five or six hours with no daytime consequences. But this is well less than 1% of the population. Yes, they are out there, but it's less than 1% of the population. So they have the benefit mm. of saying, oh, I only need five hours, and why are you sleeping more? You, you see, you're, you're not hustling as hard as I am. Well, you're lucky to have that genetic hand that you've been dealt doesn't mean that everybody mm. else can do the same thing because it over time worsens your cognitive performance. So I'd like to talk about sleep debt. Uh, obviously, uh, as we've discussed, I am a, uh, a parent currently to a six month old, amazing, incredible daughter. Uh, but the reality is, of course, I am not getting the optimal seven to eight hours of sleep that I was used to. Uh, what are some helpful situations in, 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 in over here? It, is sleep debt real? And if I'm losing two to three hours of sleep every night, what are some things that I can do uh, to to help me uh, negate some of those negative uh, impacts that that sure I yes well so sleep debt um, is very much a real phenomenon it's all because we have one of the two things that help us feel the way that we do throughout the day is known as the homeostatic sleep drive and what that does is it actually measures how long we've been awake and it does it because our brain builds up adenosine molecules from the breakdown of atp that main energy molecule for the body and when adenosine builds up in our brains, it actually binds to receptors and tells our brains, you've been awake for this many hours or this many hours. And the longer you're awake, the sleepier you feel based on that sleep drive. When you sleep, you get rid of the adenosine. Your brain gets rid of the adenosine. But if you don't sleep enough, you wake up with more adenosine floating around than you should. And then you build up more on top of that the longer you're awake that day. And that can compound over time if you're not getting your full sleep needs. So that ends up affecting your ability to stay awake and it ends up affecting attention, all the things that come along with chronic sleep deprivation. Now, what can you do? Unfortunately, people do sometimes put band-aids on the situation in which they will drink caffeine or use you know, something to keep them awake during the day. Caffeine, interestingly, blocks the adenosine from binding to adenosine receptors. This is the main way that energy drinks give us energy. They don't actually have energy in them. They just make you feel really awake because they've just caffeinated you to the point of thinking, you don't have any adenosine built up in your brain, but your body gets rid of that caffeine over time and the adenosine is still there ready to bind. So you're not really getting rid of the adenosine, it's just a temporary trick to your brain. Now, the main thing that you can do is really addressing the core of the issue, which is over time, trying to pay off your sleep debt. Thankfully, you don't have to pay it off one for one, otherwise many of us would have to sleep the rest of our lives to pay off the sleep debt that we've racked up. Um, but you do right. have to ex spend extended amount of time in bed over the course of weeks. Um, and so if you can spend excess time in bed for even the course of two or three weeks, you can pay off most of your sleep debt. The challenge is when you're in a situation as a parent, it's really hard to find that time to truly pay it off. So you have to make small changes in your lifestyle such that you can get 
a little bit more than what you think your typical sleep need is, but get that over a long course of time. That's the goal. Hmm. No, very helpful advice. So I, I, I want to talk about an interesting topic. I wasn't actually uh, familiar with this, but it looks like uh, melatonin supplements uh, and using those supplements for kids. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? And are there situations where it's recommended that uh, chil I, well, I should say children uh, in this case uh, are recommended to take some dosage of melatonin to help them fall asleep or stay asleep? Yeah, we'll, we'll start at the kind of the basic level. You know, what is a melatonin? It's essentially a hormone that's secreted by the pineal gland in our brains that tells us that it's dark outside and that our brains should do what, what we do when it's dark outside. Um, melatonin doesn't have too much in the way of sleep inducing properties. And the way to think about this is, you know, nocturnal animals, they also, their brains also produce melatonin at night. But melatonin tells their brains to stay awake the rest of the night because that's mm -hmm. what they do because they're nocturnal. So it doesn't have too much in the way of sleep inducing properties. What it does is it, it really signals your body clock. For children, there's almost no indication if your child is otherwise healthy, thriving, doesn't have any comorbid medical issues, there's usually no indication for melatonin because most of the problem children face are in the behavioral realm, such as we talked about sleep onset association, need for sleep training. For toddlers, it's typically limit setting, an ability to have, have limits set such that they can get to bed and consistently stay in bed. It's, it can be helpful for teenagers and young adults that tend to be really bad night owls, such that they just can't wake up in time in the morning to fulfill their social obligations, like get to work or go to school, et cetera. In that situation, they can work along with their doctor to provide some melatonin dosing to help move things, move their schedule earlier. That's where it can be helpful. It can also help with jet lag and shift work disorder, but in otherwise healthy children, there's usually no indication for melatonin. Hmm. And Vlad, before I let you ask your question, and uh, Dr. Consagra, you do not have to answer this question because it's a product-related question, but mm -hmm. I wanted to get your thoughts on the the, the SNU in general. It's, it's the first FDA-approved advice. Uh, we, we used it. It worked fantastic for us. But when I went to my pediatrician, mm -hmm. I, it, it was almost this negative energy. So now, since I have another <laughs> chance to kind of speak to you, uh, I, just wondering if you can maybe any, share any, any, any thoughts uh, uh, on that particular, uh, I guess I'll call it a device. Yeah, you know, I, I similarly, I've heard many parents that rave about the SNU. And so I think, you know, using technology to help with, with sleep, you know, I, I, I embrace technology. And so if it's working, if it's solving a problem and does not have any harms, uh, you know, I think we have to take a close look at it and see if it's beneficial. Um, and so, no, I, I do see some families, certainly they, 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 they like it. The goal over time, of course, is independent sleep, is trying to sleep on your own without having external uh, things to help you. And so, you know, but, but when you're really young, which is the ages that the SNU is used for, when you're like, you know, one, two months of age, and you're too, too young really to learn a lot of those self-soothing skills, it can be, you know, an extra help to potentially get your child to sleep better at nighttime. So, again, I'm not opposed to technology that's hel to help children sleep. And I have to also have a caveat here is that we're also developing a technology within Duke that we've tested that will come out probably the next few months that we also think is going to help children that have sleep issues become independent, strong sleepers. Um, so, so more on that in the next few wow. months. <laughs> okay. That's the only piece of information you can share with us. That sounds very, that sounds very highly classified. You didn't give an age range. Is it for, you know, zero yeah. to three months or it, it, it's, 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 it's it, you, you can't share any more. I, I could tell you, but then I'd have to kill you. No, I, no, no it's uh, no, a, a lot more coming out soon, but we've done okay. a clinical trial at Duke and it seems very, very promising. And we're working on uh, making sure we can get it out to the market and help hopefully lots of families get the sleep that they deserve. Okay. And one last question on that topic. If it yeah. comes, uh, when would that, if all goes well, that particular device come out on the market or is that really, it's, it's hard to say. Hard, hard to say, but we're hoping okay. by mid to mid to late this year. Oh, okay, that's that, that's very soon. Okay, yeah, well, not too that's, far. that sounds exciting. This is this is when we're gonna have our next podcast. <laughs> After this device comes out, I might have to tell my wife. Okay, now we can have a second child because my wife already wants a second <laughs> child. But I, I, I don't know. I'm going to need a, a lot more strategies over here first. <laughs> it's actually pretty amazing. Let me let me tell you. Well, one thing I've realized, and I've always known that sleep is just such an important part of those early child, you know, early childhood months for parents, for children. But when we started talking to parents about, you know, when we were doing some customer research about our particular device, when people would tell us, 
you know, if I had this in my house, I would have had an, a, another child. You know, it really, it really just speaks to you. It, it speaks to the kind of decisions that have to be made due to the pain and agony of sleep deprivation and what it's done to people. Um, and so, if we can relieve some of that pain, some of that misery, you know, we 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 would be very happy to do that for families. Mm. So, fingers crossed, we're able to bring it to uh, bring it to large numbers of people. Super excited about that, and we'll definitely be sure to pay it to, pay it to close attention. I actually want to speak about the setup in the room. So, yes. what kind of setup the ideal for the good sleep? Because a lot of parents are also using, you know, the stars because. It's like beautiful, nice, but it's very bad because it's giving you light, right? Well, I will tell you that for, for children, and again, depending on age, we can start with a very young child. So a really young child will, you know, first few months of life will likely need to feed very often at nighttime and will need to be close to a caregiver. And so having a bassinet, so a safe sleep bassinet uh, close to the bedside is usually the ideal setup. Um, it, the 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 Whatever you're using should be certified by the, you know, the, the Consumer Product Safety Commission. That's what you kind of want to look for, that they've met the federal safety standards. Um, and so bassinet usually for the first few months, then moving over to the crib whenever the parents are ready. The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that the, the crib remain in the parent's room for at least the first six months of life. We think that's somewhat protective against sudden infant, unexplained infant death. Um, and so keeping a child in, in the room can be helpful for those first six months of life, not bed sharing, but room sharing. Um, and then as a child becomes older, we're talking three around three years is when you're transitioning to like a, a, a big boy or big girl bed, uh, a toddler bed. When it comes to things that you want in the room, when it comes to night lights, when it comes to other things, my goal is if your child does not need it, don't do it, right? So sound machines, any sort of extra help, unless you're at a spot where you, you need to try something new because consistently the child has not responded to your typical behavioral methods to help them sleep, and they're not responding to just having a normal, dull, kind of plain, dark environment, then you can experiment with, with certain things. There's no harm in a little bit of light at nighttime, as long as it's not too distracting, as long as it doesn't cause extra fears. And so sometimes having night light will cast shadows and children have active mm -hmm. imaginations. And so you have to be a little bit careful with that. But there is no ideal setup as long as it's number one, comfortable for the child. Number two, for older children, typically on the cool side, we talk about 68 to 72 degrees, having the room somewhat cool for your toddlers and that, you know older children, adolescents, et cetera. Um, and then having things relatively quiet apart from maybe considering a white noise machine if necessary. I also want to touch upon fears uh, mm -hmm. because you, you touched uh, this topic as well. So the research shows that mostly children between three and six experience frequent nightmares. So my question is how parents can distinguish between what is normal to have nightmares versus the signs of more serious anxiety problems? Yeah, this is a fantastic question. I will tell you that usually if it's just isolated nightmares, a child is usually readily kind of calmed, relaxed once they, once they have parental intervention put back in place and they can transition back to sleep relatively fine and wake up the next day still feeling okay. If the, it is disrupting sleep to the point that the awakenings are prolonged and they're it's leading to constant sleep deprivation, then it's a problem. Uh, and then I, you also, also have to talk to the parent about how the child functions during the day. Is there underlying anxious tendencies that are not just at nighttime but also during the daytime? Do they have a really hard time with separation anxiety that you know persists when they drop off at daycare? I'm not talking the first few minutes of just crying. You know, that's, that's normal. Your child has to you know go to daycare and they might have a hard time separating from you, but they should console fairly easily after you've left after a few minutes. If it's going on and on and on, and if your child is adherent to routines, asks repetitive questions, these are all signs that they may have underlying anxious tendencies. And we know there's a strong genetic component to anxiety. So if a caregiver has anxious tendencies, they're seeing some of those signs in their child, they should take those seriously as well and, and seek out some professional help if necessary. Mm -hmm. Dr. Consagra, as you, you were mentioning, as you were speaking, I have a quick question that I want to ask you that I think it's important uh, for parents because we've experienced this. Uh, this, this is the topic related to SIDS, so sudden, mm -hmm. uh, sudden infant death syndrome. Obviously as a new parent, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's TikTok. Maybe it's the parent community. But this is, you know, like I would say, uh, very worrisome to especially first-time parents. My question to you: 
because, you know, I had a lot of anxiety with this and I would check the monitor every five minutes to see, you know, if she's breathing or not. Mm -hmm. If you have a safe sleep environment, how worried do you typically have to be when it comes to sits? Because I feel like logically speaking, I should be nowhere near as worried if I have, if I'm following safe sleep guidelines. Mm -hmm. so, so am I right in thinking that? Uh, because I feel like it's overblown and I, you know, uh, I, I'm, as a first time parent, I'm overreacting to it. And maybe it's a common theme that most first time parents go through. Even if yeah. you're not sharing the bed. Yes. Yeah. So th this, yeah. So this, is, this is tough. Uh, I will tell you that you, it, once you've done all the things that you can do from a safe sleep standpoint, is there a guarantee that nothing will happen to the child? Unfortunately, no. We know that based on the numbers, about 3,500 children in the U.S., infants uh, die of sudden unexplained infant death or SUID. Um, that can include accidental suffocation. That can include SIDS, which is death from without any clear re recognizable cause, such as suffocation. Uh, but we know that your chances of that happening drop significantly when you're in a safe sleep environment. Now, if you are, we talk about bed sharing, and certainly bed sharing, unfortunately, is a risk, despite all of the back and forth debate on social media. We know that based on the studies that we have, that bed sharing, it is risky. These surfaces are not approved based on firmness, based on chemical testing for children to be exposed to them. Um, and the other thing is, well, people say, well, fine, bed sharing, but I'm just falling asleep on my couch with my child. Falling asleep on the couch or in a recliner is orders of magnitude more dangerous mm. than actually bed sharing, you know? Mm. And so so that is one of the most dangerous situations in, for, for a child to fall asleep in, whether they're laying on you or laying on, on their own in those types of, types of surfaces. And so I always go back to, once you have done all the things that you can do from a safe sleep standpoint, on a firm surface, in a bassinet or a crib, nothing else in there, no blankets, no pillows, et cetera, for that first year of life, you know, no cords, no bumpers, uh, no smoking, no drug use, uh, limit, you know, limiting alcohol use, all those important things, um, then you are as safe as can be. There is nothing else that we recommend adding on. So we talk about like monitors and devices. There's nothing right now that's, that we routinely recommend to say you should be using this to increase that level of safety any more than what you're already getting from the safe sleep recommendations and guidelines. Awesome insight. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's uh, wrap it up, and we have a new transition on our uh, show. So the guest is asking the next guest some questions. So we have one question from you, for you, from our previous guest. So Fantastic. The question includes some curse words, so I will just... Uh, <laughs> Who is your guest? <laughs> <laughs> so the question was, what was the moment in your life that started as a FY moment and later turned into thank you moment? Wow, geez. Uh, I can tell you the exact, yeah, there was actually a, a comment that I received because I post on Facebook as well uh, regarding you know, sleep training and just sleep in general, sleep advice. And I got a comment from somebody that says, you know, oh my, you know, a pediatric sleep doc that's not keeping up with pediatric sleep research. And the thought, they opposed sleep training, so they wanted to be very vocal about it, and they were you know, accusing me of not keeping up with research. And in that moment, I was, you know, it was kind of an, an uh, FY moment. I'm like, why, you know, why would you say this? I, this is, I've done my whole life studying sleep, you know, and this is what I do for a living. And then I actually ended up making a video about it. <laughs> and, um, and just showing that, hey, look, I, not only do I keep up with the research, but I participate in the research. And why my quote was, I am the research. And I showed all the research papers that I've written, you know, and, and it was kind of like a joke. And, you know, it was a little bit pompous, but I was doing it just kind of be funny, you know, and kind of respond to someone trolling me about not knowing my field and my research, whereas this is what I do. And that video really just kind of blew up and started my whole kind of social media adventure. And so, so I kind of have to thank that person, you know, even though they were trying to be nasty online, ended up really kind of escalating my, my social media presence. So it's a, so it's a thank you to them. So, so if you are watching, thank you. <laughs> That's right. That's right. I, yeah. I love that. And to wrap it all up, the final question to you, what question would you like us to ask our next podcast guest? Yes, uh, it has to be sleep related, right? And so uh, I would say, what is one tip that you have uh, that 
um, that optimizes your sleep. How, how about that? <laughs> Fantastic. We'll, we'll go ahead and ask that. Dr. Consagra, what a pleasure. Uh, can you please let our audience know where they can find you? Anything else that you would like to share? I know you have super interesting and exciting things going on. Anything that you'd like to let us know, please do. Yeah, please come find me at, on social media, any platform, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook. I'm, I'm that sleep doc, uh, at that sleep doc. You can find me anywhere, and I'm, I try to give you guys practical, actionable, high-yield, science-based advice to help you and your children sleep. That's what I'm here for. Thank you so much. What a lovely conversation. So uh, we had a fantastic time. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.